remind everybody of the uh, ground rules for our presentation. Uh, again, if you haven't silenced your cell phones already, please do so at this time. Uh, <clears throat> please do not talk during the presentation. We want to give all of our attention to our speaker today. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we are going to have some time set aside for Q&A. Uh, when we get to Q&A, please raise your hand to ask a question, and I will come around with the microphone. Because we're going to be streaming on uh, YouTube and Zoom, we need to ask questions into the microphone so the folks who are watching at home can hear what we're talking about as well. Um, we will uh, also have folks online available to uh, answer questions that Kat's going to bring to us uh, from the online participants. We ask that you ask only one question at a time with no follow-up so that everybody in the room has a chance to speak and ask any questions they may have. Um, and when asking questions, please remember to keep it brief, share the air. There's a lot of us here. Um, we are all very, very interested in uh, today's topic. Uh, so we just wanna make sure we all have that time that we can share uh, together. Uh, as always, please remember to practice the Ten Commitments of Humanism. Uh, and then afterwards, if you want to hang out, help us uh, reset the tables. Um, and then as Wit said, uh, they have the FFRF uh, board meeting uh, that should be uh, happening here right after we're done. That being said, um, <clears throat> I am very excited today to introduce our speaker, Jeremiah Carrera, who uh, flew in, or Camara, excuse me, who flew in uh, from Georgia to be here. Uh, Jeremiah was once a member of one of the largest black churches in Ohio, uh, where at age 20, uh, he began his quest towards a deeper understanding of Christian beliefs. Uh, he once uh, believed he was going to be a minister or live a very active life in his local church. Uh, and that this was how he was going to find purpose and meaning in his life. Uh, studying the Bible actually made Jeremiah distance himself from the church, uh, which is a story I think a few of us here have heard before. Um, it was deeply disturbing that to uh, witness uh, Blacks praising so much but producing so little. Uh, when he returned to the church, it wasn't as a minister or as an active member, but rather as an investigator, uh, which... Um, <clears throat> he visited churches of various, various denominations, brought to light a common thread linking the vast majority of them. Mostly all, in his opinion, were preaching a gospel of powerlessness, which conditioned people to lean on the supernatural to take the path of the least mental resistance. Also came to discover during this time that many churches operated as big business, which I think we've uh, been seeing more and more these days. He knew the time had come, so he wrote a book shedding light uh, on the many psychologically crippling aspects of the church that keep Blacks powerless and accepting the poverty. Uh, holy lockdown, does the church limit Black progress? Jeremiah is also the author of the book, The New Doubting, uh, or The New Doubting Thomas, The Bible, Black Folks, and Blind Belief. He's a creator of the widely watched video series, Slave Sermons, on YouTube. Uh, he created Contradictions, A Question of Faith, a full-length documentary examining the saturation of churches in existing Black communities coexisting with poverty and powerlessness, which you can find on Amazon Prime Video. Uh, his latest documentary is titled Holy Hierarchy, The Religious Roots of Racism in America, which explains how the beliefs in a supreme being during colonial America led to notions of supreme human beings, and how these notions worked their way into our legal system, ultimately turning racism into an institution. So please give a big HSGP and FFRF welcome to Jeremiah. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn this on. Is this better? Can you hear me? I'm going to turn this off then. Okay. Wow. I want to thank uh, Philip Lentz. And uh, we've been talking for a while and uh, finally got to meet you in person. And uh, Whit Johnson and the entire staff of the Arizona uh, FFRF chapter. I want to thank Annie Laurie Gaylor along with Dan Barker, uh, the, the uh, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I'm really honored, seriously, to be here. Um, I've had a lot of great things happen to me, but no one has ever given me my own parking spot after a <laughs> while. 
And that's been <laughs> the highlight so far, I'm telling you that. I felt like the first lady, <laughs> you know. Um, Philip, you've learned one thing about me and uh, in the short time that we've been talking, and that is that I don't check my emails very often. So <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, I have two parts to this talk. Uh, part one is to set us up for part two. And so uh, part two reflects the title of my work. What is the title again? <laughs> what are we talking about today? <laughs> The title is, uh, yeah, why we need to eliminate religious iconography in America, okay? So part one is going to set us up for part two. So let us go ahead and begin with part one. Mass media and movies and uh, commercials, et cetera, has uh, dramatically changed, you know, in terms of of uh, the inclusion of blacks, we've all seen it. We 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 see it every day that we watch the watch television, uh, practically all areas that we can imagine. You guys remember that first interracial commercial of Cheerios? I think it was like back in 2013, and I mean they made a big stink about it. People were getting upset. There were letters written to Cheerios, and and I mean it was a big deal. This was just back in 2013, right? And so a lot of things have changed since then. That commercial received a lot of backlash, a lot of harsh criticism. And the world is, has changed not only because of COVID, but society has dramatically changed after the public execution of George Floyd. We have never experienced such a diverse America before in mass media, or what appears to be diversity. But what have Blacks actually done or accomplished to deserve this over-representation in commercials, in television, in the news? We are vastly overrepresented. What have we actually achieved or accomplished as a group that have made us so noticeable in the eyes of the general public? It is estimated that Blacks are now 90% of all commercials, 90% of the commercials that we witness have Blacks in them. So why are we seeing just 12 or 13% of the population in 90% of the commercials? Black representation seems to be everywhere, overrepresentation. Blacks are even singing the American and the Canadian national anthem and before all white audiences and National Hockey League games. What on earth is going on? <laughs> Why the love all of a sudden? Today we live in a world where social media can make us or break us instantly. Uh, individuals as well as companies can be uplifted or ruined overnight. So maintaining a wholesome, racist, free, diverse reputation seems to be the priority of many companies today. Companies are desperately launching what I think are preemptive moves, preemptive strikes, uh, by placing Blacks as the face of their advertising campaigns. And they do this just in case they're accused of racism. They can proudly claim that, you know, our ads are often the face of Black people, you know, our, our advertising campaign. So you can't accuse us of that. Michael Kors, Tommy Hilfiger, I could go on and on. In the New York Times, I was reading the other day, it stated that some brands may be thinking defensively. There are reactions to the Black Lives Matter movement that are, that's often based on fear. It talked about the influential Instagram account and industry watchdog that has called out Dolce and Gabbana and all other uh, industry players uh, as being accused of racist. So nobody wants to be called it anymore. Being called a racist will destroy contracts. It'll just, you know, move you off the face of the earth, so to speak. 
it is nearly impossible to see three commercials in a row that do not have black people in them. And if you find one, if you find three, call me. I don't care if it's three in the morning. I want to know what they are. But commercials are not just there to advertise their products. Commercials are there to influence our attitudes and shape our ways of thinking. Commercials train us and persuade us, and they often manipulate our behavior. And although there are many races of people, commercials mainly show the interracial, uh, interracial relationships primarily between blacks and whites. And so, um, what are obvious acts of Black being placated is whenever we see Blacks and whites together uh, in commercials, especially in a comedic way, uh, there are always, and I repeat, always 100% of the time, the Blacks are portrayed as the ones who seem to have it together, uh, and the whites are portrayed as the goofy ones, the clumsy ones that just don't seem to get it or the ones that have been fooled. We see this all the time in commercials, okay? And I've personally accumulated about 50 ads that show this black and white dynamic, about 50. And you know that I'm gonna do a, a documentary. <laughs> you, know that it's, you know that it's coming, <laughs> okay? So when we consistently see this, we know for certain that there is an agenda that's, that's happening. Not necessarily an agenda that is sinister, but an agenda nonetheless. And again, I ask why? Why are Blacks so special now? Why are Blacks, this small 13, 12, 13% 13 of the population overrepresented in mass media? Why are Blacks overrepresented on Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu, et cetera? Why the love and attention? All of a sudden, are we now a colorblind nation? Is racism now over? Are Blacks and whites now equal? So now we're gonna move on to part two. So please bear with me. I promise you I'm going to get to the good religious stuff that I came for today, okay? But we got to start with this. Malcolm X said that racism is like a Cadillac. He said it changes models every year. And when George Floyd was publicly executed in a society that was digital, our mobile phones captured the senseless murder in real time. The harrowing footage of George Floyd made America and many parts of the world, especially Europe and America uh, and the United States, made us pause and, and, and think about racism and bigotry and hatred and how it actually looks up close and personal. Most whites were ashamed and appalled by what they saw. And because of the upfront and personal nature of Mr. Floyd's death and the aftermath that came with it and the criticism and the protests and the continuous backlash that it received from blacks and whites, something had to be done. And something had to be done not to make blacks better, but to make blacks feel better. So the Cadillac industrial complex had to hurry up and change its model. Mr. Floyd's death gave birth, or helped to give birth to Black Lives Matter. Whites are now bending over backwards to make Black people feel better about living in a racist society. So what kind of Cadillac model do we find ourselves in now? I call it uh, all that I've been describing here, the age of appeasement. Blacks are being hoodwinked with the old illusion of inclusion trick. And although Blacks are being represented throughout the heavens and the earth in mass media, Blacks are light years, light years from so-called equality, 
justice and economic independence. Blacks still have the same collective net worth today as we had 150 years ago. In 1863, Black America owned one third, one half, I'm sorry, of 1% of the national wealth. Today, it's just over 1.5%. So for all the whites that think that Blacks are somehow taking over some way, somewhere, somehow, I can assure you sleep well at night because nothing is further from the truth. That's just not happening. In America, we live in a system of capitalism. And this means that it, if the money is not integrated, then really we're still segregated. And I see segregation, me and my wife, we're doing well financially. And we tried to get a $30,000 loan and could not get it. $30,000 to, to, to do some stuff with the property that we have. Black net worth is uh, 24,000 per household. White net worth is 189,000 per household. There is an $11 trillion uh, racial gap in wealth, $11 trillion racial gap. And one out of every five black families have a, have a negative net worth. So essentially what this means is that despite all of the inclusion that we're seeing in mass media, Blacks are in no way being lifted from off the bottom rungs of society. American media is essentially, excuse my, my French, pissing in all of our ears and telling us all that it's raining. Now here comes the juicy religious stuff that ties into all that I've been saying so far. The stuff that's gonna prove that America has only changed its model of its Cadillac. Every bleeding heart liberal, every so-called non-racist advertiser or business, nearly every white person who plants a Black Lives Matter sign on their lawn draws a line in the sand somewhere. No matter how much they stand against racism, they have a line somewhere that they draw. Let me give you some examples. Many humanists and atheists, agnostic or free-thinking groups such as ourselves are proud of our all-inclusive stance, and we should be. We stand against racism, and we should. We stand against sexism, and we should. People that attend anti-religious conferences like the Freedom From Religion Foundation and others are predominantly white, of course, for many reasons that go beyond the scope of this uh, talk. But one common reason why so many drop religion and become free thinkers is because they are dead set against the violence that this God projects in the Bible. And people say that, you know, God is good. And my question is, which one are you talking about? Because if you're talking about that one of the Bible, I know you haven't read the Bible. But throughout history, it seems that violence keeps our stomachs full. If it weren't for the violence projected upon Africans by Europeans during American colonization and the violence of American chattel enslavement, whites would not have the privilege that they've enjoyed for centuries. Where would this country be without violence? Where would Miami or Las Vegas, for example, and many other great U.S. cities be without drugs and violence. So is that what I'm speaking of? Is that the line that I'm talking about? No. Am I saying that violence would be accepted by whites today in order to maintain a system of white over non-white? Absolutely not. So what is that line that most liberal whites tend to draw in order to keep at least the psychological supremacy over Blacks. It's the line of white biblical iconography in mass media and in public places. No one, not even a secular group, are saying a word about it. It's so normal that it's not even noticed. No matter how so-called diverse the media wants us to believe that we are, they draw a line when it comes to the, to the diversity 
and all things related to this so-called God and this so-called Jesus and to these so-called biblical uh, uh, figures. On Hulu, we can find films and series like the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Jesus. I think it was on Netflix. Now it's on Hulu. And you won't find any Blacks on there to any significant degree. There have been countless, and I mean countless, of biblical films. I list a lot of them in my film, Holy Hierarchy, which can be seen on, on Amazon Prime. Uh, Holy Hierarchy, the Religious Roots of Racism in America. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, and all the other networks that have biblical films all project Jesus, his disciples, his friends, and all the men of the Bible and their friends and their families, et cetera, as white. And no one says a word about this. No one. Not our groups. No one. Do we really understand the devastating psychological effects of this? I'm not sure that we do, but I'm going to talk to you about how that feels from this side of the fence. When we subject Blacks and other non-whites to biblical images that reflect an ethnicity different than their own, we do a great psychological disservice to that group. The non-white often perceives this depiction as authentic and subconsciously perceives themselves as subordinate and sometimes as even inferior. So much of what we believe as individuals start with the imagery to what we've been exposed to. When other non, when, I'm sorry, when non-whites see images of a white Jesus and white biblical imagery, the brain concludes that God must be white. I mean, that's what your brain is gonna do. The picture of white Jesus was in my kitchen as I grew up. I grew up and my mother and my father had a picture of white Jesus in our kitchen. And I knew that this was real. You know how I knew? Because I was like five or six, but everywhere I went, the eyes followed me. And I never saw a picture do anything like that. But the eyes followed me, and I was like, this is real. That man is real right there. And if this non-historical Jesus is portrayed as white, then white supremacy must be justified then. If we allow that, and we don't protest against that, because I know if I saw black Jesus everywhere, and I'm going to show you the places where he, I would feel a little, my chest would be stuck out a little bit. We protest against Confederate statues and monuments demanding that they be taken down and removed from public facilities. But no one says a thing about white statues and billboards and monuments of white Jesus that are projected everywhere. We might not believe white iconography is everywhere, but it is. White religious iconog iconography is routinely seen in Walmart, Walgreens, CVS, churches, hospitals, airports, billboards, books, movies, doctor's offices, schools, universities, everywhere. Legislate. Listen, thank you. I went into um, the Capitol building in Atlanta. Oh my, white biblical imagers were everywhere. Okay, now, in fact, I just picked this up yesterday here in Phoenix. <clears throat> Here's my Walmart bag and I have my receipt. To show you that I picked this up at Walmart. The white Jesus, they're all in here. It's everywhere. Okay? If you ever been to the dentist, there's a book similar to this. You know, they used to leave this there. And there's, there's nothing but white pictures of, of everywhere. And it's so common that we don't even notice it. 
Now, if Jesus did exist, which we all know he didn't, for a thousand reasons that are beyond the scope of this talk, if he did exist, which he didn't, he definitely would not be white, not being in that region and not speaking that language. But we're not talking about that because I have people come up to me and say, well, you know, he was in the... You're talking about a God who has an ethnicity? Think about how absurd that is to think about a God who actually has a name and an ethnicity. Now, that is very human that he has a name, I'm sorry, uh, an ethnicity, and he speaks a language predicated upon a human alphabet that was invented by human beings. It's really crazy, but I digress. So let me get this straight. We're secularists, but we allow this lie to shine with unbridled liberty throughout the United States. We're secularists, and we don't take umbrage against not only seeing the existence of this lie, but seeing this lie portrayed as a white man and as white men. Is this because most secular groups are white? I've heard it so many times. I've heard it. I look like a preacher wiping my eye. I've heard it so many times. Well, you know, you can't do anything about that because we're, we're protected by the First Amendment's right to freedom of speech and freedom of expression. White bibliography and white Jesus has nothing to do, in my opinion, with freedom of expression or freedom of speech. Why? Because they all look the same. They all look the same. All the Jesus, the Jesus that we see are white men with long hair, long stringy hair. They pretty much all look the same. Now, um, Jesus, as we know, is not history. No one was ever born a virgin or walked on water or ascended to heaven. We have no historical portraits of this biblical Jesus or of any other biblical figure because they're not historical in the first place. Why biblical Jesus in mass media is simply a matter of subconscious acceptance and historical parroting. It has nothing to do with freedom of speech or freedom of expression. The character of Jesus is projected as white because that, that's what history has always done. No one has argued about it. No one has, has tried to do anything about it. You see this kind of stuff so often that we don't even pay attention to it. It's so common that it seems natural. If I ask every artist in here to paint a house, each person's house would be painted differently. If I say, draw some people in that house, each person, would, they would draw, it would look different. But these white Jesus, they essentially look the same. That is historical parroting. You're just depicting what you've always seen and what no one has protested to. I'm protesting against it. I've been wanting to do this since the early 90s. My wife can tell you, I wrote a lawyer a letter in 1992 about this. I was 29 years old. This has been bothering me <laughs> since I was 29, okay? <laughs> really earlier than that. But you all would draw something and paint something different. That's true freedom of expression. That's true individual, what a, a, an individual artist would do, okay? But if I said draw a picture of Jesus and you weren't thinking, he's going to pretty much, they're all going to look pretty much the same. I've been told that we must prove damage if you're going to bring this, you know, Thing up where you don't want this kind of stuff dis displayed publicly. You have to prove damage. Well, again, that's beyond the scope of this because there's a lot of damage. I mean, you have any idea how many black churches this have white Jesus stained into their windows? Do you have any idea 
about the church fans that get passed around in the black churches with white Jesus on it. The, there's a country, I don't know if you heard of it, but it's called Nigeria. And they, are, they proudly display the second largest statue of white Jesus on earth. And they're proud of it. Okay, how's that for psychological damage? How's that for damage? White Jesus, really? I mean, can you appreciate the heavy psychology of all this to non-whites, really? And there will be Blacks who will defend this. There was an episode of Good Times years ago, obviously, where Florida said, that's the only Jesus I know, this white Jesus, he's standing on the wall. Can you imagine Black Jesus in your household? Can you imagine in the churches that you, that you came up in to have Black Jesus stained into your windows? Can you imagine the heavy psychology of that? Um, the fact that we can have a discussion about Confederate figures and Confederate flags and Confederate monuments about all, uh, all these you know, Civil War heroes or whatever, and not have a discussion about a non-historical white Jesus that are thousands of times more prevalent speaks volumes. And let's get one thing clear. I want to clear this up. We're not asking for a black Jesus either. So for all of these, all of the blacks who want to paint Jesus as black, I mean, I really feel bad for you because here it is. You have, this is so insulting, I don't even know how to put it, but it's very insulting for Blacks to believe that Jesus was Black, and we're on the bottom of society. He doesn't even do a damn thing for his own people, but you believe he's Black. This is crazy. Now, if I was religious, I would definitely pray to that white Jesus, though, because he'll do something for you. That black Jesus didn't even let us hold on to Harlem. Harlem is gone. <laughs> Motown is gone. We don't even have Detroit. Listen, I, I have friends here from Chicago. They're born and raised in Chicago. So you all check your wallets when you leave. <laughs> but um, we know about the greatness from New York in the Harlem Renaissance, County Cullen and Aaron Douglas and James Weldon Johnson and Madam C.J. Walker and Duke Ellington and Langston Hughes. And I could go on and on. But Detroit is really, for reasons that are beyond the scope of this talk, really the heart and soul of, of Blacks in this country. That was the first place where we really Black people really became upwardly mobile in masses. The average Black person had a home because they worked at Chrysler and Ford and GM and stuff like that. We don't even have Motown. So I don't want to hear anything about a Black Jesus. I've always said that if Blacks and whites were two teams competing psychologically on American turf, whites would have the home field advantage. And you see how well people how well teams do at home. Look at all of the major sports teams record at home versus on the road. They're always better at home. That's how whites operate in this society. They have a home field advantage. We all know that there is a certain amount of censorship that's involved also in this digital age. We saw this during COVID and the many uh, experienced doctors who were against vaccinations were taken off YouTube and weren't allowed to voice their opinions. Google kind of changed the goalposts on us very frequently. We saw that many Trump supporters were shut off of mainstream media and taken off of social networks. So we know that there, hell, I've been shut off YouTube for various things, but we know that there is a measure of censorship that goes on in this country. We know that. Let's not pretend that it, that it doesn't happen. 
you can't say certain words against certain people without being thrown off of various social platforms. And, I, you know, I kind of find that amusing because you can't say this, you can't say that, but you can say the N-word all day on all platforms. All day and keep it, and, and it'll stay perfectly fine and nothing will happen. But I digress. But let's do something here. I know that Alex had and, and Josh had told people to put their cell phones away, but while I get a drink of water, can you all take out your cell phones and turn them on, please? All right. You don't have to sell, don't have to turn your ringer on, but please, please take out your cell phones. All right. I want you to go to Google and I want you to Google God and then Google images. Right. Right. There's no censorship going on here. You see what I mean? But that same media and the same Google and these same networks want to give us the illusion of inclusion, but they draw the line when it comes to including us with all things that are biblical. You see, we see clearly here, we can see here clearly that black lives may matter, but black minds don't seem to matter much. Remember the movie A Time to Kill? You remember that with Matthew McConaughey and okay. And there was a, he was a white lawyer that was defending a black man who wound up killing two white men for raping his daughter. Okay. And they had an all white jury there in Mississippi. He asked the jury, he said, close your eyes and imagine that this little girl was, was white. It changed the entire opinions now of that jury. Okay. I want you to close your eyes. You don't have to, but just close your eyes and imagine that Jesus, the film Passion of the Christ, seen by hundreds of millions of people, all the Jesuses and biblical figures on Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime, and all the biblical imagery seen in all the religious universities like Notre Dame and Holy Cross and Baylor and all the hundreds of thousands of nativity scenes that we're going to see, that Walmart produces, and that we'll see in people's yards during the holidays, and all the books at Sam, and all of the white imagery at Hobby Lobby. I don't know if there's a Hobby Lobby here. That is one of the most racist stores on earth. Imagine that on the covers of all of the books and all the religious billboards throughout the country displaying white Jesus and all the st statues and wall, mark, wall art in thousands of hospitals across the country and all the white Jesus and biblical figures everywhere. Now imagine them black. Wow. That changes your dynamic a little bit, right? How do you think we feel? The conscious ones. I'm not talking about the living dead. The ones that are awake and see the game. That's where the most bleeding heart white liberal or all-inclusive secularist or white kumbaya or white uh, we are the worlder draws the line. Yeah, I would love to see biblical religious iconography in public places become illegal in this country. It should be. That may never happen just as black economic equality may never happen, but we can certainly do one thing, and that's draw attention to the fact that white biblical iconography creates a thin line between believing in a white supreme being and believing in a white supreme human being. The implications of a white Jesus and white biblical iconography throughout this country and the world are anyone. It speaks directly to that which what we've been fighting against 
and that's white supremacy. So the question is not whether whites they believe they're superior. The question is how could they not? How could you not believe that? We see all of this diversity in media. We see and know, everyone knows this is happening. And Blacks are feeling some sort of liquid in their ear. We just want to know if it's piss or rain. If true diversity is really happening, then in addition to leveling the economic playing field, let us strive to economic, the psychological playing field where it all starts. If Black lives truly matter, and I saw a sign out there at this building that said that it did, if it truly matters, then Black minds matter also. Let us fight all the way, hell, to the Supreme Court if we have to. Who other than us secular groups are going to do it? Because the non-secular groups, they believe in this character. It's up to us to do it. So when I pull up and I see that sign, I want to really believe it's true. No one should be subjected to this kind of stuff. No one, not in a country where you say everyone matters and we're all equal and let's hold hands and let's show commercials. Let's show you guys in 90% of the commercials to show that we care. This shouldn't be happening. Now, I mean, I want to, I want, I want, I want you to know that it's up to us. Okay. I'm on the board with Freedom from Religion Foundation. Dan Barker and Annie Laurie uh, Gaylor, they're my friends. But I don't think that we are interpreting the Constitution correctly. I don't think so. That First Amendment, I don't think it applies to something like this. And if it does, then damn it, we got to change it. Now, when you get a moment, I want you to visit our nonprofit organization that we set up. It's called ERICA. ERICA stands for Ending Religious Iconography in America. Okay? And I want you to donate. And I want you to encourage your friends to donate because we need as much firepower as we can to take this as far as we can. And don't worry, I'm not Creflo Dollar. I'm not going to buy a jet with the plans. This organization is going to be totally transparent. And I hope to get the attorneys involved at Freedom From Religion Foundation to set up trust funds where the money cannot be touched, where you will know how much that you've uh, given to this, how much you have donated. And it's nonprofit. But we need help. I want to know that's rain that I feel. I'm totally 100% transparent. And we need to fight this insidious white supremacist monster in the form of white biblical iconography. Let's fight this monster since it appears as though we're all together anyway. Let's find out if we're really sincere about changing racism or if this age of appeasement is really just a new Cadillac. I appreciate you guys. All right, thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. Um, so we got a few minutes uh, remaining. We're gonna uh, go around the room for some Q and A. Um, as a reminder, when we get to Q and A, try and keep it one question. Try and keep it on topic and no follow up, so everybody in the room has the opportunity to speak. Uh, <clears throat> I loved your talk. Uh, it was about something I hadn't even thought of about before. But doing the talk, something else occurred to me. How about a female Jesus? 
<laughs> All right, transsexual Jesus. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I don't want to do any Jesuses. <laughs> at all not even not even a bear jesus or a tiger jesus nothing because it's it, you know we, that's another topic because you all know how i feel about religion and how how just insidiously harmful religion is and i just i'm one of the most anti-religious people that you can run into Ellen. Given what you just said, and I agree, there shouldn't be any Jesus, but people believe that he, if he existed, he, well, based on where he was born, he would have been Aramaic. And I have been trying to look that up. And every time I do that, it doesn't get me very far. <laughs> I mean, it starts saying, well, all this belief about white Jesus yeah. or whatever, or anything like that. But then it doesn't quite say the people of this country were actually more brown <laughs> yeah well that's because the people in silicon valley are not aramaic <laughs> don't speak aramaic i'm sorry i'm not arabic but hey right. questions do we have anybody on zoom cat How do you feel about the prevalence of Black Santa when it's like holiday time and it's kind of relationship to, yeah. to your topic today? You, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> I could give a finger to Black Santa, Green Santa. I don't care about anything. Listen, let me just say this, and I'm glad you brought that up. Let me say this. This is my wife here. We've been married would it be 34 years, I think, in June. We have three beautiful children, successful children, three grandchildren. We never celebrated Christmas, Easter. We never wore green on St. Patrick's Day. My wife has not even get, gotten a piece of chocolate on Valentine's Day. But you know what? I do for whatever. Uh, <laughs> but she knows I love her. And, you know, we have to understand that because I don't do these things does not mean I'm anti-white. It's just that I'm black and these are not, these have nothing to do with me in my culture. I mean, the Irish and the blacks had a very contentious relationship. And you think I'm gonna put some green on for St. Patrick's Day? We've never, taking our children out trick-or-treating, not one time. We've never put a tree up. I'm a truth speaker. And I took my children out, with our, our first house in Stone Mountain was near a lot of woods. Well, I did give my wife some chocolate because Dan Barker sent some during uh, that time. So she did get a piece of that. But anyway, we were out in the woods and I asked my, they were little. And I was, I said, you know, where do birds live? And they say in the trees. I said, you know, if we cut them, they have sap and you can fill it. And that's kind of like their blood. But if we cut the trees down, where are the birds going to live? My oldest daughter, she started crying. I said, we don't put a, knock a tree on and put it in the house. Trees belong outside because they help us breathe. They help clean the air. They give animals and birds places to live. And I just told the truth. And if me and my wife, Especially me, because I played with them more. I bought them stuff year round. I'm not going to give the credit to a bearded white man coming down my chimney. That's not going to happen. So there is not a mutual respect of Black culture that Blacks have for white culture. And I can hear what you're saying now. Well, what is black culture? That, my friend, is called white supremacy. I mean, white white um, privilege. That's white privilege. Where you can ask, you, just to ask that question. Well, what is black? You don't even, see, you can go through life, don't have to worry about that. My connection, and a lot of it has been lost because they look at our names. We don't wear our names. We don't wear our clothes. We don't 
we are immersed in white culture. But as far as the holidays that get us to extract our money from our pockets every month, it seems like I don't deal with them. And this is one of the reasons why I've been able to save money because I'm going to get you for Christmas. This Christmas, the same thing I got you last Christmas. And that's nothing. <laughs> Hi, I mean, as you're aware, oftentimes um, religion can be a very sensitive topic among friends and family and um, people will just shut down um, depending on how the subject is brought up. What are some ways that you recommend that we can get people thinking about the things that you've talked about today? Did you see the movie? Um, I'm, uh, what was that? Was it? Was it? Was it? I'm a star. Where the the big guy, yeah, and he had the book, and he was showing them, and he was had the white Jesus. He was showing them, and that's some serious psychological damage that this African man was showing on this picture of this white man who was his savior. Get a book. And just say, what would you think if they were black? And if they recoil and reject, that's your answer right there. But we're okay with all that we see on television. I mean, how many watch Lifetime? Lifetime Movie Network. You don't watch Lifetime? I'm the only one that watches <laughs> Lifetime. I'm the only one. Wow. I only... <laughs> I only do that because my wife sometimes has it on. <laughs> but you're not going to see a lifetime without a black cop or a black detective or something like that. It's just, and 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 I think America has believed, oh, they're okay now because look, we're going to give them a show. We're going to give Dwayne Wade, who. He now has his own show. We're going to give this person his own show. And now they're good now. But you got to realize we are not in Hollyweird. You, you know, I grew up with people like, I grew up with around Black Panthers. and I did. I, they told me, man, what are you doing celebrating Christmas? I mean, they talked to me. It made a lot of sense. And none of, you know, none of my children were freaks. Nobody looked at them and they're all doing well now. Truth can be told. And if you're honest, you know, how did I know? And there may be some out here that did not receive what I said today very well. And that's okay, because I can't please everyone. But how did I know that when I came here today that I would be received uh, relatively favorably after my talk. The reason is because I, I knew that I wasn't going to come up here and tell the truth. You can't trick an honest man. And as long as you're honest and you tell the truth, use that as your guidepost. Take that as the ground. That's your ground. You see that as your guide and you just speak honestly and truthfully, if you don't recoil about the inclusiveness that it appears that we're having on television, but you will recoil about, you know, seeing Moses and all these people, you know, then um, something's wrong. But let me tell you, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, all of them, they're wrong. You shouldn't have this on because there are going to be Blacks watching this. There are going to be non-whites watching this. When I was in Walmart yesterday, there was a lot of little children, a lot of little children over there where I was. You think they didn't, or, well, Jeremiah, they didn't really see it. Wait a minute. The average person sees between four and 5,000 ads per day. So right now, I might, may not know how many pictures are on the wall. I may not know how many men or women in here, but when I leave, my subconscious mind will be able to tell you everything. Because the subconscious perceives things in totality. 
So just because you're at CVS and you don't directly, constantly see a magazine, just by you walking by, your subconscious gets it. So we need everyone to come on board with this. Once we cut that out and we present to the world how crazy it is for your God that we are making us think about Confederate monuments, but we say nothing about this, it'll really show the hypocrisy of this country. And now we'll be able to have a discussion because the way that we resolve, you know, I play music. Are there any musicians in here? Okay, so Alex, a dominant chord is unstable. It's looking to be resolved. Music teaches you that no matter how unstable something is, how uncomfortable or how dissonant it is, it can be resolved. And so we're all uncomfortable with this, but we can resolve this. And so when we, you know, start talking about these white Jesuses and how uh, Walmart and Sam's and all this, how they shouldn't even manufacture these things, is going to create some dissonance and some uncomfortable feelings within people. But the way that you do it is not by putting someone in time out. You don't do that. You talk about it. You don't take a person who disagrees with you and put, take them and, and exclude them from now being on your social media. You can't get on social media anymore. You talk about it. And you demonstrate the error in his or her ways and what they did wrong and what they can do better. That's how we need to approach Sam's and Walmart and hospitals. My wife was in the hospital back in 2017. I'm not talking about Boise, Idaho. I'm talking about Atlanta. I'm not talking about the outskirts of Atlanta. I'm talking about Atlanta, Atlanta. Right. And when you walked into it, it was flood, North Side Hospital. It was flooded with white biblical imagery. In Atlanta, that's a lot of nerve. <laughs> this is the Bible. Anything north of the Canadian border is the Bible Belt. But just going in there, it just seems like, and I'm looking at this stuff, and when you visit ericanonprofit.org, you'll see all this. And I don't, I mean, my, cell, my phone is replete with imagery. I see it every day, every day. And you know why you don't see it? It's the same as if you get a car. You know how you buy a new car and you start seeing your car everywhere. The minute you start looking for it, you'll see it everywhere. You just don't see it because you're not looking for it. All right, so we're running pretty close to time. We'll take one or two more questions and we gotta go ahead and, and cut it out, I think, Marty. I just wanted to thank you and FFRF for bringing you here. And uh, you are the reason, you are like all of the reasons that I joined HSDP to learn more, to change my, uh, now I, it's not a matter of changing mind. What do I wanna say? My worldview. And it's just keeps expanding. I never thought about this. And I'm so happy you're here. I appreciate that. And I want to thank you also for coming and sharing your time with us. A couple of minutes ago, you said something about knowing the truth and speaking the truth. And I think you tapped on something which is those of us who grew up in ignorance about uh, white privilege and about white Jesus, um, we don't know the truth because everything we've been taught and believed was untrue. Blacks should not have to educate us, but 
those times when someone like you steps forward and says, okay, I'm going to show you what the truth is. Those are treasures, and I just appreciate you coming and helping pull some of the, the uh, lies off of our eyes. Thanks. Thank appreciate that. I think we had one more from Vici, and then we've got one from online. Sorry. <laughs> I don't have a question. I remember being taught that the paintings of Jesus were done white because Jesus was being sold to Europe, and especially Northern Europe, and they felt that the people would identify more with him if he was white. And I remember learning that in school. But it was a marketing ploy. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, Clarence Thomas went to <laughs> that Clarence. <laughs> you know, he went to a Catholic school. It's, there's, listen, we could jump on him, but there's a reason why he is the way he is. Imagine the imagery that he saw down there in Pinpoint, Georgia. And his, the nuns and the sisters and stuff that he was exposed to, and the walls and the imagery that he saw at the time. There's no way Clarence Thomas grew up with a healthy view of himself and of other Black people. When he saw a Black person, he saw the image of, of himself and he saw the image of that which did not reflect anything that had anything to do with God or Jesus. So Clarence Thomas was a person that was saturated with imagery because he went to Catholic school. So we have one from our service and participation director, Mars, who is joining us online today. Uh, she says the Bible uh, says that uh, man was created in God's image. Um, what do you think was meant by that? <laughs> uh, you know, if you watch my film, Holy Hierarchy, it, 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 it talks about that. And it shows you how during one talk in Mississippi, they use that to justify their discrimination. There were laws written in 1667 that said that God was on the side of the slave master. You see, there were actual laws that were written that said that. So that right there preceded, I think the first King James version was written, what, 1475, I think. That preceded that. So if, if, if this was crazy, then you know that had to be crazy right there. So I don't, I don't, you know, they use it as a justification, you know, and white Jesus was a supreme justification for white supremacy. And whenever the colonizers took over the place where they were, what's the first thing that they did? They erected that cross. And nothing is sillier. I mean, this is crazy. Like, you see Black people with this cross around their neck. That is, like, I just want to say, you know, bless your heart or whatever. Because you just, <laughs> you have no idea who you are. And, you know, I've, I have really found, I, I've been to many places in the world I've really found a lot of joy in this life, embracing who I am in my own culture. It doesn't mean that I don't embrace up. I, I mean, my here, you go in my office, you're gonna see Albert Einstein. <laughs> you're gonna see, you know, uh, 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 I, I don't have him yet. Matter of fact, I asked Neil deGrasse Tyson if he could be in my first film, Contradiction, and he said no because he didn't want it to interfere with his public persona. And then a month later, I came here to Mesa, Arizona, or Tempe, and I went to Arizona State University and I interviewed Dr. Lawrence Krauss. And Dr. Lawrence Krauss, he said, where, where, where was your last interview? I mean, uh, is this your last interview? I said, yeah. 
but we tried to get Neil to He said, Neil didn't do it. He said, why? He said, damn it, he grew up in Harlem. And um, I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to talk to him about it. He said, I tell you what, I'm going to waive your interview fee. He didn't even charge me. And if you watch my film and you see Lawrence Krauss, he was fighting a bad cold. He just got over the flu. He was on his way to Europe. CBS had just left his office. And he was on his way to Europe. And he had tissues all around. But if you watch Contradiction and you can just see the enthusiasm that he came with, and I love him for that. Oh, absolutely. He's awesome. All right. And I think we have one last comment from Anita. I just want to say one of my favorite things to say is life is a learning experience. And if you don't learn something new every day, you're not paying attention. Boy, was I paying attention today. Oh, wow. Thank you. Then uh, before we close out today, one more question. Um, you've been pretty good at messaging all of the places we can find you, but let's hear it again. Where can we find you if we want to hear more about you, follow you online, uh, find your videos, find the organizations you're a part of and get involved? First of all, I promise the white Jesus, not the black one, but the white <laughs> one, I'm going to start being more active on social media. I got off for about three or four years. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 listen, I got off to focus on my business. And during that time, I became a business person. Before I was just a person who had a business. Now I'm a businessman. And I focused on that. And I haven't really posted anything on Facebook or anything like that or YouTube for like three to four years, right? I needed that break. It did a world of wonders. I have not watched the news since March the 11th, 2020. But it doesn't mean that I don't know what's going on, but I have not watched the news. I got so tired of who shot who and who shot who. When I cut it off the news, there were four things that were prevalent. Uh, Biden, Trump, COVID, racism. COVID, Biden, racism, Trump. Trump, <laughs> Biden. Those are the four things. And when I cut it off, it, I just kind of freed myself. I just, I said, wow, life is short and I'm not going to be inculcated with the depictions and the information. Like it's naive or misinformation. It's naive of me to think that I can go downstairs with unbrushed teeth and wipe my eyes and making a cup of coffee and put the news on and sit down and think that I'm being informed of what's going on in the world. That's just not going to happen. But I'm going to get back on. So to answer your question, Josh, you can visit jeremiahkamara.com. You can visit ericanonprofit.org. And when you get a chance, go on YouTube and visit Slave Sermons. Just put Jeremiah Kamara. I have 50 episodes of Slave Sermons. I was one of the first theories on YouTube. Uh, up, you know, to happen. And so that's all there. So I appreciate your support and I appreciate you guys having me here. Thank you so much. Hey. <laughs> One second. And I just want to uh, point out as well that both of the documentaries we talked about today, I looked at this morning, they're included with Amazon Prime. So go home and watch them. And to close us out, we have a tradition here at the Human Society of Greater Phoenix. And that is to mug our speakers. <laughs> so within you'll find a little bit of information about us and a coffee mug just for you. <laughs> so thank you. Awesome. Are we clear? We are clear. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah, for a fantastic talk. We, I'm sure a lot of us have learned.